Hi friends, I feel like I'm late to the party. I honestly feel like that every week, but especially with this movie, or maybe I've just been on TikTok a lot more this past weekend. But honestly, long form content and my job just seem to clash every week. There's just not enough hours in a day. Anywho, I've been loving everything I've been seeing about this movie on social media. I love all the TikToks, I love all of the memes, but I especially love Josh Berlin's Instagram post from February. He said in his caption, Dune 2's release is less than two weeks. Robot Lady and Wonka fall in love. Then Elvis tries to f it all up while his bad dad floats in a pool of pond scum. The WWE dude from Guardians of the Galaxy gets super pissed while Midsummer Hottie puts the eyes on Wonka Obi-Wan just after his mom gets caught taking LSD in a sandy bathroom. Chigurh still doesn't like the guy from The Goonies. The caption goes on a little bit longer and it is absolutely hilarious and actually perfectly kind of encapsulates the movie. Before we get too far into the episode, two things. As always, links to all of the articles and TikToks mentioned in this episode will be posted in the description. I'll probably have extra links because honestly, I've spent a lot of time on TikTok lately. Lastly, and I have to be honest here, I am not familiar with the source material, so no prior book dives or deep lore here. My review is based purely on the cinematic experience of part two and watching part one at home twice. Hey there, movie lovers. Welcome back. It's your movie buddy here, ready to talk about the latest movie I watched. Whether you're a longtime subscriber or follower, or maybe you're just a new face, I'm thrilled to have you here. You can expect spoiler-free reviews and my honest thoughts about the latest movie I watched in theaters or maybe one that I streamed at home. You can catch weekly releases dropping every Friday. Have a movie in mind that you want me to talk about? Hop into my DMs on Instagram, drop a comment on YouTube, or let me know on the podcast. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, follow on Spotify, and follow along on Instagram so you don't miss out on what I'm up to and what's coming up next. So grab your popcorn, hit that subscribe and follow button, and let's get into today's episode on Dune Part 2. Paul Atreides unites with Chani and the Fremen while seeking revenge against the conspirators who destroyed his family. Facing a choice between the love of his life and the fate of the universe, he must prevent a terrible future only he can foresee. From what we've seen in Part 1 and 2, Dune delves deep into complex themes that are simultaneously straightforward in their execution. I know we're focusing on part two, but it's essential to recognize how this installment builds upon the foundation laid by its predecessor. The idea of free will versus fate, power and suffering, religion and control, power and fanaticism, and more are intricately woven into the fabric of the film and expertly executed. I particularly want to highlight the exploration of free will versus fate because of the way my jaw was on the floor. I love this idea so much and the way it's portrayed here in this movie because I had a specific, let's just say I had an idea in my head after part one and at one point in part two, I literally found myself thinking in the theater, you are going where I cannot follow. And in that moment, I was actually stunned. It's not a direct quote, but if you're familiar with the line, then you might know where this is going, right? I don't wanna talk about it too much and give spoilers, but I mean, I was really shocked. Again, I've never read the books, but this is literally like one of my favorite tropes. So witnessing its masterful execution on screen in a way that I wasn't expecting at all when I sat down in the theater was nothing short of breathtaking. Moving on, we've got to talk about the character development because again, I was shocked. But we're really just going to gloss over everything, even though I said we're going to talk about it, but we're just going to gloss over it because I'm trying to avoid spoilers. I'm sorry. What I will say is there's really strong character development here from Paul in the forefront throughout the movie. I love the motivation and how that motivation twists and evolves in a way that you can see coming a mile away that still somehow feels abrupt. I want to say Chani as well, but honestly, that's just, I feel like it's just a me thing because I totally misjudged the character from what we got in part one. Obviously, when we see her in part one, she's almost entirely seen in dreams and visions. Again, I haven't read the books and Fantastic Frankie posted a TikTok where she really puts into words how I was feeling when I was watching part two. I was expecting her to be much less of a character than she was. Like Fantastic Frankie says, 
a ethereal love interest that was just there for Paul and his character development. Chani really surprised me. She blossoms into a multifaceted individual with strength, fierceness, and vulnerability. I love that she maintains that softer side. I love that she is both. She is everything. I just love this character. What set her apart and makes her one of my favorite characters is her defiance, particularly regarding prophecies and the eternal struggle, again, between free will and fate. I love it. It's this complexity that makes her character truly captivating and interesting. We're going to talk about the look of this movie. Honestly, it is a feast for the eyes. Everywhere you look, there is something really interesting to look at. Maybe you're looking at the cast, maybe the way they're positioned in frame, maybe you're looking at the machines or the sprawling landscapes. Every aspect of the visual composition is a testament to the filmmaker's artistry. Overall, the special effects are solid throughout the movie. Some elements were just so visually impressive, but even more impressive is the impact some moments had on the story or the characters. Now, I want to talk about what I can't stop thinking about. You already know. The depiction of the Harkonnen planet of Gaty Prime. Visually unreal. The planet is illuminated by a black sun. The planet's altered hue creates a surreal atmosphere that transcends the bounds of traditional cinematography. I put a couple links in the description that better explain how this look was achieved, but quickly put, cinematographer Greg Frazier shot the sequence through a modified Arri Alexa LF IMAX camera, turning it into an infrared camera that lends a hauntingly striking quality to the footage. The resulting black and white imagery possesses a distinctiveness that feels like it belongs in another world, and not the traditional black and white cinematography audiences are accustomed to seeing. The look of this black and white is extremely distinct, and I'm pretty sure my jaw was on the floor during the scenes where we're shown the transition from color to black and white. When the characters go from interior, familiar, yet cold colors to the exterior lighting of the black sun. Amazing. But it's not just the aesthetic appeal, it's the profound storytelling implications intertwined with the visuals. A Screen Rant article says that Fade Rotha is a monster with no redeeming qualities, and the presentation of Gaty Prime as a black and white void helps to eliminate any sense that there's another layer that makes this person worth empathizing with. On a basic note, it just looks incredible. I love the translucency and brightness of the skin and the dark of the eyes. Not only does this technique visually inform the Harkonnen, but the character of Fade Rutha especially. Moving on to the acting, we're going to keep talking about Fade Rotha. Austin Butler, freaky little bald alien, incredible. Butler delivers an amazing character performance, and I was completely blown away every time he was on screen. Not only does his bald cap add to him looking like a freaky little alien, but whatever he was doing with his voice really brought the character to life, truly leaving a lasting impression with every single scene. We're going to talk about Timothée Chalamet-Bing-Bong. Timothée Chalamet. Incredible. I love how much he's been able to explore the character of Paul Atreides, and I really love how much he's giving. I'm having a hard time not considering the character journey from part one to the end of part two, but we're essentially getting two characters here as Paul is plunged deeper into that whole free will versus fate. His nuanced performance captures every facet of Paul's internal struggle, the resistance throughout, and who he turns into when he stops resisting. Timmy really embodies the character and plays every angle of Paul spectacularly. Zendaya's portrayal of Chani is another highlight of the film, and we're going to talk about her again. I really love Zendaya as Chani. I love that Zendaya really fuels the character's complexities through subtle yet powerful moments, and I love Chani's role in the story. I love that her role is expanded, which we obviously expected, but like I said earlier in the episode, I really thought she was going to be a different type of character. She got incredible agency, and Zendaya shows us as an audience where Chani is as a character. There's so many layers here, and I appreciate the acting she does without dialogue so much, but I don't want to spoil anything. 
Florence Pugh is amazing and I love her. Anya Taylor-Joy shocked me somehow, even though her name is in the trailer and she's been on like a bunch of red carpets. Christopher Walken, legend, an incredible on-screen presence with the time he has. Rebecca Ferguson, incredibly talented, and she really brings the complexities of her character to the surface in a way that makes me wonder what she is up to all the time. Javier Bardem, half the time he is hilarious. And the whole time, he emphasizes the idea of religious fanaticism in an extremely compelling way. If you've been here for a while, then you know I love Dave Bautista. I really like him in these movies. I just wish the character got more range and time overall, but I think he did great with the time he had and with the character. I'm glad we got some subtle moments along with those more explosive moments. I cannot talk about everyone, but I will say the entire cast is incredible. Not everyone had the most screen time, but just about every member of the cast is memorable. The chemistry overall really elevates the authenticity and credibility of this intricate world. Wrapping this section up, I just want to say that I saw this movie in XD and the way they turned the volume all the way up. The soundtrack is still vibrating in my skull and I loved every moment of it. Hans Zimmer's masterful score deserves special mention for its ability to captivate and enthrall, seamlessly intertwining the narrative to evoke a palpable sense of atmosphere and emotion. There's that signature blend of iconic melodies and that texture that come together in an incredibly powerful composition. His music serves as a powerful companion to the story and to the characters, enriching the viewing experience and leaving an unforgettable impression on the audience. Now, let's wrap up with my final thoughts on the movie. After going over the story, ideas, characters, and more, the real question remains. Is it worth your time? Obviously, yes, but let's lay it all on the table because I know not everything is for everyone. So let's talk about it. Again, I think you should see this movie if you haven't already, but let's talk about the flip side for a second. I saw some negative reviews, and from what I read, it really seems to me like the reviews miss the point of the movie, they don't understand the movie, or again, this movie just isn't for everyone. Dune is complex. I would say that that's a fact. There is a lot going on, a lot of plans behind plans, a lot of manipulating, ulterior motives, and everyone's favorite, politics. It's a lot, and it's not for everyone. Part one arguably has nothing going on in it. Yes, there's a lot going on, but you know what I mean. But if you follow me on Instagram, then you know I rewatched part one, and then 20 minutes later, I was seated to watch part two. Having seen part two, I can say that I absolutely appreciate part one so much more. While part one may seem slow, it lays essential groundwork enriching the payoff in part two. If you've been here for a few episodes, then you know I like monsters and creatures. Well, I finally got more sandworms, and I was very happy with that. For the worms, CGI, great. Practical effects, great. We got more Zendaya, Florence Pugh, I love, she was there, it was fantastic. I'm ranting a little bit, but the negative reviews I saw had issues with the pacing, dialogue, and the actors. At this point in the episode, you know I didn't see any issues with any of these elements. All that said, as usual, this one really comes down to preference, it's just what you like. One thing I will say that bothered me was how I perceived the romance between Chani and Paul. Based on TikToks I've seen in the books, their relationship is developed over a couple of years of Paul being with the Fremen. In the movie, however, I felt that this was rushed, having taken place over the course of a few months. However, this doesn't really impact the overall story for me personally, but it was definitely something I was thinking about in the theater. Also, another reason it might not be for you that I somehow almost forgot to mention, part two is nearly three hours long. If you've been here for a while, then you know I support long movies if there is material for it. Dune part two comes in at two hours and 46 minutes and it uses its time incredibly well. Yeah, it feels like a long movie, it is a long movie, but not in a way that had me checking my watch. I was fully immersed and I wanted to see what would happen next and how the story would unfold. The skillful storytelling really captivates the audience on a meaningful level. Part two is a better movie. If we're looking at the story in fractions, the stakes are higher, 
that power and control is more elevated and clear, the world building becomes richer and more intricate, the visuals are even more impressive, and again, the free will versus fate, the sheer magnitude of this movie cannot be understated. And all of this is done in a way that enhances the experience of part one. Have you had the chance to watch Dune part two yet? If you haven't watched it yet, what's holding you back? Not your cup of tea, not your genre, is the movie just too long? I'm curious to hear your thoughts after today's episode. And if you've already watched the movie, I want to know your take. What did you think about it? Share your thoughts, opinions, and reactions. I'm all ears. Whatever your opinion of the movie, it's valid. If you thought part one was slow, boring, and had nothing going on, then diving into part two probably seems like a big ask. I totally understand. Dune Part 1 came out before I started doing these types of videos, but honestly, I would have said the movie is really good, but not one that stuck with me. It didn't captivate me by the time it was over. Part 2, on the other hand, had me wanting to buy all the novels so that I can completely immerse myself in this world. Dune is best seen as one film, one cohesive story. I would encourage you to do what I did, watch both parts back to back if possible. I know I said not everything is for everyone, and I stand by that, but I would also say to watch this on the largest screen possible. I did want to see this one in 70 millimeter IMAX, but let me just say, comfort matters, especially if the movie is almost three hours long. I've grown very accustomed to the seats at Cinemark, comfortable, recliners, butt heaters, and plenty of leg room. Last year, my honey and I went to watch Oppenheimer in 70 millimeter IMAX, in the nearest big city, and you guys, it was so uncomfortable. I was having flashbacks. Back in the day, trying to get to my seat in a crowded theater, trying not to step on people's toes, which I will admit, I have done before. My point is, this movie deserves to be seen on the largest screen. This is what theaters are made for, and it's an experience. I've seen people online comparing the scale of the movie and its impact on cinema to the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the original Star Wars trilogy. Dune isn't complete yet, but I don't think it's too early to agree. Dune is probably, quite honestly, definitely, one part away from being a masterpiece, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. Part 2 is an exceptional film on its own, and the anticipation for Part 3 only heightens its significance. Part two isn't just a movie, it's an experience that really reminds us what epic storytelling looks like. Part three is years away, but it is clear that Dune is already carving out its own place in cinematic history. All right, movie fans, that wraps up another episode. If you're enjoying the episode on the podcast, a huge thank you for tuning in. For our YouTube viewers, you'll find a link to the podcast in the description below, and don't forget to give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. As always, thanks a million for joining me today, friends. Your support means the world to me. And remember, the movie talk doesn't stop. So tune in every Friday for fresh episodes. Don't miss out. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Follow on Spotify for on-the-go listening. And join the fun over on Instagram for behind-the-scenes sneak peeks and more movie shenanigans or just regular shenanigans. As you probably know, if you've been here for the last few episodes, the next movie I'm watching is Kung Fu Panda 4, and I honestly cannot wait to re-watch all the Kung Fu Panda movies. I'm going to talk to you guys about the fourth installment and all the movies in general because it is one of my favorite animated franchises. Finally, the last movie I have tickets for is going to be Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. This movie looks like fun, and I honestly almost passed it up in favor of watching the, the horror movie, the Sydney Sweeney movie, um, Immaculate, but... I remember that I enjoyed the last Ghostbusters movie and of course the original Ghostbuster movies as well. I'm really interested in the story and how the original cast is going to be used in this movie. For updates, this section might sound a bit familiar, but I want to keep you guys in the loop. I'm holding off on imaginary for now, but I'm still going to try to make time to see it when I see it. And if I see it, I'll let you guys know. Since the last time we talked, I did plan out, well, I loosely planned out my episodes. I will be doing a podcast exclusive episode on the Netflix film Damsel, which will maybe post the same day as Imaginary if I watched it. Then Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. I'm planning another podcast exclusive episode for the movie Stop Motion, and I have to say, I'm really excited for the podcast episodes. Honestly, I wanted to do more last year, but I totally dropped the ball. So far, with the way things are loosely planned, I feel like I'm doing better than I did last year. 
That podcast exclusive will drop in April. Godzilla X Kong will be pushed out probably to the following week because I have a family vacation. Last week, I shared my thoughts on Out of Darkness. If you missed out on that episode, please be sure to catch that one on the podcast. And if you're on YouTube, you can click the top right corner of the video. Your feedback and thoughts on that episode would be awesome too. As always, I'm looking forward to you all joining me on YouTube, Instagram, and of course, the podcast. Don't forget to tune in on Spotify for those exclusive episodes. Your presence and engagement truly make a difference, and it means so much to me. I value your feedback. It enriches our little community and makes this a fun place to be. Share your thoughts in the YouTube comments or hop over to Spotify for our Q&A and polls. Whether you're following on YouTube, Spotify, or Instagram at a.rocket.review, I'm eager to hear your thoughts. Until next time, spread positivity, be safe, take care of yourself. And Frank Herbert, the author of Dune, wrote, The mystery of life isn't a problem to solve, but a reality to experience. I think this is an amazing quote from the novel that was used in part one, and it really stuck with me. It's pretty intense and it's heavy to sit with. Also, it's from the 60s. It's so interesting to think that it still very much holds up. It's still relevant today. Okay, not me rambling at the end of the episode. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.